Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Ian Pekarski of CMF Metalworks. Ian is an old friend of the show, but if you're not familiar, uh, he's known in the custom knife circles for his organic designs, his finesse with fine materials, his thinly ground, beautifully profiled blades, melt in the hand ergonomics, and a barely there flipper tab that works like a charm. CMF Metalworks knives are coveted among collectors, but not the easiest to acquire. So Ian has set out to change that. <clears throat> We're going to catch up with Ian and talk all about it. But first, excuse me, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Download the show to your favorite podcast app so you can listen uh, while you walk out the door. And as always, check us out on Patreon. If you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show, you can check out the exclusive content, the knife giveaway opportunities, and uh, other stuff there. Just go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check it out. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Ian, welcome back to uh, the Knife Junkie podcast. It's good to see you, yeah. sir. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, I wanted to get in touch and congratulate you on your um, market penetration, shall we say. Uh, you've been <laughs> making these beautiful custom knives, handmade, each one, uh, one at a time, for a number of years. And uh, you've really built up a head of steam with, with a fan base and collectors. And uh, and then there are people like me who who admire your designs from afar. Well, you've made it possible for people like me to own your knives and I want to talk about it. So tell me a bit about sure. the print. So I, I am particular about the, uh, the knives that I'll put into production. I think we talked about that last time. Um, I don't want to do any of my like main lineup custom designs. Um, and it's just a personal thing. So I spent, I spent months designing, and refining and talking to people, uh, a model that I would make, you know, into production. Uh, sorry that this one's pretty. I had to I use it to fix some stuff. Um, but this is what came out. And uh, it's, I think it's got, you know, it's kind of a mixture of that data list that you had uh, on the last podcast, as well as a little bit of the crusade. Um, and then a model that I don't know that a lot of people know about called the Affair. Uh, it was one of my models from 2019, kind of my first dive into like the really curvy handles and kind of trying to go more slim. Um, and I wanted to make something, you know, that was mine, but that would only be production um, as well as being a canvas for, for modding. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted it so people could swap out the thumb studs. I wanted it so people could swap out the pivots, um, the bearings that they want to. I mean, it's, uh, I even got rid of the floating backspacer so it'd be easier for people to take apart. I don't uh -huh. want people to take it apart, but just, you know. You know they will. I know they, oh, absolutely. <laughs> they always do. Uh, so the idea behind um, keeping your custom models custom and your production models production and, and ne'er the twain shall meet, that's, that is a smart idea because it seems like it maintains the value of both. Um. Yeah, I think so. I, I think to me, it's more I just don't want to put my custom designs overseas. Um, I mean, these are being made by Riot. Uh, and then, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, I have the Matt Crusades, which um, is one of my custom designs, but it's being uh, machined, all the parts being machined by HMC Knives in, uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, Jim Vandeveld, great guy, great machinist. But everything is USA made. Uh, the steel is sourced from a company in Texas, SB Specialty Metals. The titanium is from uh, a company in Ohio. All the hardware is made in, I want to say Montana, by Tie Connector. I get my belts from a company in Ohio. 
Uh, all of Jim's machining tools, I believe, are from Lakeshore Carbide, which I'm pretty sure is a USA-based company. But I know I did as much as I possibly could to make everything about this USA made, which is why I felt comfortable doing my custom design for it. Um, the, the price point's obviously different, but I, this... I wanted... Go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to say this is actually really, really exciting because we've had so many conversations on this show with makers trying to do what you're doing or wanting to do what you're doing in OEMing a well, I mean, I guess you're not OEMing. You're you are assembling. Are you assembling these uh, these Mac Crusades? Are, are you? Uh, are yeah. You... So he he sends me the way I, the way that they work is I get uh, finished machine parts um, with the exception of the pocket clip. Um, which I have to finish myself, but basically, sorry, I'm trying to figure out the camera. There we go. So this is all machined. This is all machined. There's pocketing on the inside. Um, the pivots are just plain pivots. And then the blade is unground. The lock isn't cut. There's no detent. Um, so I, you know, I'm hand grinding these. I'm finishing all the parts myself. I'm doing lockup detent. All, all the action is, you know, my standard action that I have on my knives. It's not, someone else doing it as where this is you know this comes finished right right oh wow okay yeah all right so this is in a way it's like a mid-tech you remember we used to talk about mid-tech yeah. a lot i think that's such a hard word because everyone has such different definitions for i it. know i know i know my definition for it was the correct one which was exactly what you're doing <laughs> you know yeah. ha having all the parts made but but you're the guy who puts it together it's your action it's your grinding and, yeah. you know, I think that is really, that's, that's great. You know, so that's half of what we've been talking about here. Like uh, there's, there's this idea, wouldn't it be great if we could have a robust OEM knife making community here in the United States uh, right yeah. now, the, 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 the financial end of it doesn't quite work. Um, but that's what everyone is, would like to achieve at some point. Um, and that's not to say anything bad about amazing companies like Riot and Best Tech. Uh, who who just do amazing work, but you yeah. know that would be nice to be able to do here. So, I think I mean, you're Jim taking... has a great thing going. Um, I mean, he's he's doing phenomenal work. He knows machining. He knows the knife community, and I you know I can't wait to see what Jim is doing in, in even a year's time. I mean, the stuff he's doing now is incredible, and I can't wait to see him expand and get he's... you know more USA made knives. So he's the he's in Erie, PA. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. All right. So as it I, sounds as, close, but he's actually like he it takes more time to drive to him than it does to my parents in Vermont. Oh, oh, wow. OK. Yeah. I used to live yeah. in Cleveland and uh, Erie was close by. But what we were talking about before about how Pennsylvania is such a great knife state, uh, you know, yeah. you have a lot of uh, Bradford and uh, and then just a lot of knife makers kind of sprinkled throughout. And that's, yeah, there's a fair few here. More yeah. than I thought. More than I thought even last year. Okay, so I, I want to talk some more about the print. I want to get back to the print for a second sure, because sure. that snuck up on me. Uh, frankly, you know, I follow you on Instagram, and for some reason, I don't know, maybe I just wasn't in a in a uh, spending mood and I wasn't seeing new things. But uh, how, tell me about that process and and how it differed from from you know, say, doing the Mac Crusade or or a full custom. Um. I mean, it was just kind of making the prototypes. Um, I did a pass around. I made the initial design and then I made the first custom and I brought it with me to, oh my goodness. I made it right in the midst of COVID. So it would have been 2020. I, so I didn't bring it with me to any shows. I did a pass around for it. That's what it was. And I had people give me feedback on it. Hmm. And then I made it a second prototype, passed that one around, made a couple changes. And that's the one I ultimately sent out. Um, and then it was just, you know, waiting game, prototyping to come out with, you know, this finished design. Um, yeah, what, I mean, it was... What, what were the results? What were you hearing from the pass around groups? What were the kind of changes you made to the initial prototype? Uh, I mean, sometimes I have to remember that my hands are just made of calluses. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, it was chamfering here and there, slightly larger, uh, like... Uh, can never remember the word just like little cutouts for your thumbs to unlock stuff uh, -huh. uh different different thumb studs we went with um 
I, I found that these thumb studs, I'm actually trying to go away from them and kind of go t more towards towards this style. Oh, okay. Uh, just because I feel like they're a little easier to get a grip on. Uh, yeah, I mean, nothing major, just some small tweaks, changes, uh, small placement pocket clip type deal, just so it's more comfortable in the hand. Okay. Okay. It's well, I mean, the reason to, to me, it's just kind of funny because I had that Daedalus, you, you loaned mm -hmm. that, that to me, um, father of Icarus. Uh, yeah, I learned, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, Icarus. Oh God, it's so beautiful, but, but it was so refined and it felt so good in hand and it was such a, uh, you know, very, very high end piece, you know, that I ever held, you know, and, uh, and to me, the idea of, of, kind of coming back with a criticism of it uh, seemed a little funny because it has its own internal logic. You know, none of it, mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? That one on top is just beautiful, by the way. I um, didn't get to see which one that was. I don't remember. It's that one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's a Paladin. <laughs> paladin. That is a uh, one of the first, like, three or four. Who are your, who are your design... Um, I'm looking at the palette, and when we were just uh, back up there looking at that, it reminds me of a. It doesn't remind me. It to me, it looks like next generation of a certain movement of knives that came 30 years ago. Uh, who are your influences? Uh, I I feel like we maybe we maybe touched base on this before, but when I got started, uh, Tough Knives is who initially taught me mm -hmm. kind of like the basics of making knives, and he introduced me to you know Rob Carter. Um, I think at that time, uh, I can't, I, unfortunately I can't remember the guy's name, uh, Neil Blackwood, that's Neil, Neil Blackwood, I think was still making knives at that point. Uh, Jeremy Marsh, Dalibor, um, Lee Lerman, you know, these kind of guys, I, I had no prior influence into the knife, into the knife world at all. Mm. So, I mean, seeing those over the first couple years and trying to design my own stuff and then i mean now when i design i try not to look at anything <laughs> like yeah. I, I try not to follow any knife makers uh any significant amount on at least on instagram or whatnot right, right. um just i don't want their work to influence mine at all yeah uh <laughs> i i am not self-proclaimed as a ph uh phd level redneck engineer that was actually given to me by one of the admin in my group um uh jordan o'neill <laughs> and uh because i he saw that i made most of my parts with a hand drill until i got my lathe uh a couple years ago amazing yeah, yeah uh, uh, please don't get me wrong i wasn't trying to suggest that your designs are derivative in any way no, it's, uh, it's but okay. i was i was looking at that paladin and i was thinking man that's got the grace of a of a of a master design like uh ken onion you know it, it doesn't look like a ken onion but it has that same organic flow and i see that throughout your designs but it's not uh, that can oftentimes be a turnoff because it means immediately that your hand is going to be forced into a certain position. You're going to have to use this knife the way, you know, just one way. And yeah. and I, I don't get that from this. So you've, you've got both of those aspects in there. Um, I, uh, I actually do a bit of my designing based off the curves of your hand. Where am I going? Here I am. Like, um, like where your lines are, like where, where you sit. So for like this knife, I'm not going to be able to show it. But the way I have it is oh. so it sits right where your hand folds in. So the secondary hump, you don't actually feel it. Your thumb just sits there. And that curve down towards the pommel nestles uh, right into that muscle of your thumb there. Yeah, yeah. So you're not, you're not catching that at all. Um, I love it when people get one of these and they're just like, I don't even feel that second hump. Like I thought it was going to be sharp, but you don't feel it at all. Um, and that's kind of the same deal with the print. I, uh, I designed it to kind of fit directly where am i going sorry <laughs> i'm all over okay. the place today um to fit in your hand in between all the you know where your hand creases yeah the uh the ergonomics of it and then the thin thin blade uh you the one the the um the one that i had the dead dead list that i had short uh, for a short period of time had a very thinly ground hollow it was a hollow grind if i remember correctly. correct yep, yep um yep. So I noticed on the print, you went with a flat grind. Uh, how, well, uh, the final product does have a hollow grind. Oh, it does. Okay, so that's a prototype you you're holding. That. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is this is one of the prototypes. Okay, so how do you, is it always hollow ground for you and, and why? Uh, I, I started off hollow grinding. 
um, Rotten Design, uh, John Sorensen. He helped me when I first got started into modding knives and gave me a lot of pointers on how to hollow grind, how to freehand hollow grind, just how to how to get that wheel to work for me. And it's just kind of stuck with me. Um, I practice flat grinding, you know, once every couple months to make sure I can still do it. But I... I just love hollow grinds. I think the blade ends up being a little lighter. You get, I think, cooler patterns when you use Damascus because mm. um, you are thinning it out towards the bottom, especially like on a sand mine. Unfortunately, I don't have one here to show you. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's slicier. I think I just, I, I love them. I, I do too. I I just love to even look at them. I mean, they're great to use and uh you know, you're not going to want to use it to baton wood or anything stupid like, you know, anything uh, over overdone like that. But I love the yeah. way they look. Honestly, uh, when I got my first cold steel uh, Tonto in high mm -hmm. school, that was part of it. It looked like a big, giant straight razor to me uh, with that hollow grind. And so it's always kind of been, you know, a uh, an appealing thing to me. But now in my older age, I realize the practicality of it and how you can yeah. sharpen those kind of you know for a long time before you know before you need to really reprofile it. it it's funny i i know that each grind kind of has its own place um and as far as collecting goes um at this point i really only collect fix i can't talk today either i really only collect fixed blades and this was actually one of the first knives that i ever got um nimble, not this nimble. one exactly back when i got started i actually had to sell the one i had to pay my rent but uh, I was able to get another one because this knife just meant so much to me. Um, this was the first like knife that I purchased back in 2015 or 2016. I bought it for $20 at a yard sale. Wow. And uh, it just got me into fixed blades, which got me into knives. But that's this is where I learned like my love of flat grinds. Um, I, I don't love them on my folders. I, I think that my hollow grinds just work better with my designs. But a uh, good flat grind is just spectacular and i i just love really any fixed blade with a flat grind is going to win my heart so so if you're only listening uh uh ian just held up a nimervis uh, yeah by, by benchmade and you got that for 20 bucks at a yard sale that's a that's a screaming deal I, I did yeah with the sheath and everything uh this same one the black coat black cerakote uh for anyone who is listening, it's the Benchmade 140. If you want to see what it is, it's Benchmade 140. So, uh, what what other do you collect mostly? Uh, production fixed blades, or do you have? Uh... Uh, I prefer custom ones. This is um, a kid named Will Freeman. Have you heard of him before? I don't think so. So he is like eight. Well, he was. He was, I think, thirteen or fourteen when he built this. Uh, oh I got it Blade Show of 2019. Oh, good Lord. That is beautiful. Big yeah. recurve chopper thing. God. It's W2 with a Hamon. And it's it's just perfect. It's gorgeous. It has a feathered Damascus um, guard here. I don't remember what the wood is, but I mean, the kid is incredibly talented. If any of you are God. looking for a fixed blade, I don't know if he's still making, but Will Freeman knives. <laughs> Will? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Will. Just Will. Will. Okay. Yep. Uh, that is... You know, that would fit beautifully on my wall back here. You know, it kind of yeah. reminds me of a Filipino kind of recurve thing. Love no, it. It's man. good. It's good to go on the belt too. I mean, no one no one says anything when you're walking around Walmart. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. It's this like, is, do you have uh, any registers open? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, this is Alex Garcia out of uh, oh. New York. He he made this for sorry, I use all my, my fixed blades pretty hard. So they're all just kind of covered in tape. <laughs> uh he made this for me uh at a at a new uh, god i cannot talk get it in new jersey in 2018 i think and it's been my shop knife ever since but his knives now are are just spectacular he's another one you should check out alex garcia alex garcia i, I like yeah. the look of that too i like a um i like a nice chisel grind uh i know people yeah. tend not to not to like them as much because they're a little weird, but man, they can get so sharp yeah, and uh, crazy, and, crazy sharp. Yeah. And, and if the chisel is on the right side for your mm -hmm. handedness, so to speak, mm -hmm. it works great. Uh, that's, yeah. that's something that always stuck in my craw about the Emerson brand, a brand that I love. I love Ernie Emerson and his designs and everything. And I even love that they're mostly chisel ground 
uh, all the edges are chisel ground anyway. And um, but he puts it on the other side. He puts it on the on the left appropriate oh, side, yeah. strictly yeah. for aesthetics. I mean, he told me that, and I don't like that. It should be the other way around. No, I've only made two chisel grinds, and they've both been for right-handed people. So it doesn't bother me having a flat, you know, on the show side. I think as long as that side is finished in the same way, I think it looks really nice. Yeah, I do too. It's a it's a it's a good look. So was that were your chisel grinds uh, special requests? Uh, one of them was somewhat out of necessity, uh, and then the other one was a request. The first one, I had a piece of Armor Core Damascus that uh, <laughs> I accidentally had surface ground uh, on the same side twice. Oh. <laughs> so the core was actually all on one side, uh, and it made for a, a pretty cool knife because I was able to uh, – it it's a lefty, so I lied. It is on the, it is on the show side. Um, but this way, you have the core all along the back, and then you have the core on the show side, but the edge is all core. There's no, you know, there's no patterned steel. And it looked, it looked really cool. Yeah. Once, once the podcast is over, I can try finding it for you. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds pretty cool. So we're talking about materials, and I mentioned in the intro how, you know, how your use of materials, that's something you're known for, because it's, it's written all over your knives they're they're yeah. really beautifully uh depicted in these exotic materials and you were just showing a couple off before we start, started rolling i want you to show uh right now how did you go from hand drills to using some of these unbelievable materials it seems i'm kinda... still using hand drills by the way like i'm okay I, all I right three of them in the shop I use them <laughs> everything. well i got to me, that, that I mean that that makes things more impressive because the, you know, your knives are so refined and yet they come, you know, they're 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 coming out of something that's a little that seems a little less so. So show show off that one with the gold if you don't mind, and, this and is a let's talk knife. about this. I'm gonna keep. So this is a full Mokutai frame lock with a damasteel blade. The this pivot is gold and meteorite. The back spacer is is gold, and then the lock side pivot is gold as well. Uh, gold caps, like not gold threads at all. That would just mar up and be bad. Um, this actually also has my ghost flipper tab. Oh yeah. All right, so that's what I was talking about uh, up front. I I forgot that it's called the ghost flipper tab, but it's yeah. you you can't you can't really detect it. <laughs> Unless you run your finger over it and then... Uh, there you go. You can yeah. kind of get a glimpse of it there. This one is about one... Like one thirty second of an inch tall. Kind of see it there on my forehead. Oh, yeah. Then... yeah. yeah, Man. I love that. How long did that take you to develop? About, about a year. Just trying to got... figure out the geometry, trying to figure out the detent, the whole sizes, how far you press the ball and how much tension. Right. Um, like this is actually quite a large flipper tab for me at this point, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I, I feel like it's silly to say, but no, no, I know, but you can see it more than the other, but uh, with the gold knife again, I want to go back to working with gold yeah, a little yeah. bit. Now, sure. what's it like, what's it like working with gold? I mean, my, my presumption when you said that the pivot was gold was again, that the threads were not, um, yeah. because it's a soft metal, but but in terms of having it in that spot and in terms of shaping it, isn't it still a soft metal to have on a knife? Uh, it is. I tend to go for lower carrots. Um, this way it is a little bit harder. Um, we're going with three quarter hard gold. I mean, it's still going to scar up a bit in the pocket, but luckily gold is so soft that it's really easy to refinish. Mm. Um, and then you pair it with a material like meteorite, which is also pretty easy to refinish. And then you have a, a pivot that essentially you can wear in as much as you want, send it back to me. I'll spin it on the buffer, re-etch it, and you have a brand new pivot again. Uh, that's one of the beauties about, about working with gold, in my opinion, is that even if you mess up, you still have gold and you can sell it and get, get more gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or meteorite. What's it like? Yeah. So what's the meteorite? Like you said, it's as soft as gold and that seems like a great strategy no, no, no. to uh, put those together. It's not, it's not soft. It's, oh, uh, it is it is hard, but the, the benefit to it is the finish that you see. I, I have a piece here I'll show in a second. Okay. The benefit to it that you see is all that pattern is is caused by etching it. 
So as soon as you polish that etch off, you can re-etch it. I see. Um, so like here is a piece of Gibby and this is like my personal piece. This is one of the most gorgeous patterns I've ever seen uh, wow. on Gibby and Meteorite. Uh, I think I have another piece here with a slightly tighter, um, slightly tighter pattern. All right. I'm, I'm going I'm, but... I'm to ask a question that sounds like a real noob question, but is that actually cut out of a meteorite? Or is it somehow yeah, no, re this is, recomposed this is and that's amazing. It comes this like is, that out of the sky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, as you can see, this is the edge here. That is, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is see. what was burning up in the atmosphere when it slammed into uh, that's amazing. Namibia. So when you say Namibia. Uh, hold that up. You That has a bunch of right angles and parallel lines in it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're all just off. Because they say there are no right angles or parallel lines in nature, but that comes close. Yeah. Also, that's not true. Bismuth is almost exactly perfect right angles. Oh. Well, those people. From what are I remember, liars. I could be totally wrong. <laughs> those but... <laughs> people are liars. It I looks have... like the surface of the Death Star. I actually used this on a knife and called the pivot the Death Star. Oh, <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, all right. So I'm but not this a total. Is crystallized nerd. iron. Yeah. No, it's just crystallized iron from you know being hot molten iron floating around in space and then slamming into earth it's just slow crystallized iron so are any of these crazy materials uh um hard to hard to work with or nerve-wracking i would imagine gold might be because of the expense Ooh, what's which one is that but so do these this is gibeon as well gibeon yeah same as the other one just a slightly different Slightly different pattern. It's going to be harder to see because it's not as vibrant. Right. You can get a little bit of it there, but that's like what the outside looks like. This weighs about a pound and a half. Wow. Yeah. Uh, to back to your question, Gibeon is a pain in the butt to work with. It is. Uh, it, it's. It's. It's kind of brittle. It's not brittle, but it is brittle. Um, which sounds ridiculous, but if you hit it in just the right spot, it'll shatter. Um, but if you take it slow and you do everything with fresh new drill bits and fresh tooling on the lathe, um, and fresh belts, it stays together beautifully and it's really quite durable. Um, with uh, zirconium, is is zirconium the one you have to watch out for in terms of, isn't there some sort of flammability issue? Oh yeah, that? zirconium spontaneously combusts. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, spon spon uh, zirconium dust, I should say. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so if you have a room full of it, if you're not uh, if if you're not properly, um... yeah, it's very similar to like a magnesium fire. Um, if you've ever seen like like a YouTube channel with magnesium fires on it, that first one there on the on the that I just posted, that's zirconium bolsters. Oh, um, can you click on that first one, Jim? I believe that's it. Might it might be really loud, so I don't know if you have sound on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, those bolsters are zirconium, as is the backspacer, and. Uh, you you can tell it's zirconium when you grind it because the sparks are white hot, whereas titanium sparks are red hot. So oh gosh, look at that. Yeah. So the pivot on that, did you sculpt that as well? Did you? No, that's a tie connector pivot. I just tie... domed it, domed oh, okay. it, and finished it. But that okay. is a that is a stock tie connector pivot. Their stuff is incredible. Steve is such a nice guy. Um, I, I'm so glad to be able to support him. Um, his pivots are spectacular. Normally I try and go and finish my own stuff in my own stuff, but I think I thought this build just needed something slightly busier for the pivot. And, you know, Steve had just the right thing for it. Yeah. I like it. The, the sort of sunburst pattern around it because the rest yeah. of the night, the knife is kind of dark and, and the, um, uh, like a little foreboding and the blade itself has kind of a web feel. But then you yeah. have this sort of little sunshine spot. I, I like that. It's very mechanical, I think. And uh, I think it just adds adds a nice little little pop. So what materials have you not used that you want to that you want to explore? I've used platinum uh, just to make a couple of backspacers. I'd love to make a platinum scaled knife. Um, it would be unbelievably expensive and it's also a catalyst, so it's not the safest thing to have near zirconium dust. Um, but I'd love to use that. Um, there's a, a type of meteorite that's kind of like a glass meteorite. 
I don't remember the name of it right now, but if you look up meteorites on eBay, you'll find it. It kind of looks like uh, like stained glass windows, and it's it's cool looking stuff. I'd love to use that in some aspect. Um, I'd love to use some stones like lapis lazuli or jade. Mm. Um, I I don't know. I'll use anything. I I love working on knives and uh, woods are on my list of stuff to use. I just haven't had the uh, the chance. Have you used ivory? Seems like something that would go nicely with your designs. That old uh, mammoth ivory. I yeah, in fact, I have some like right somewhere here. I, have, I sorry, I moved everything for this, and uh, now I can't find anything. I love the look of natural materials like wood, and but especially ivory and stag and that kind of thing on a modern um, modern knife like yours. Uh, R.J. Martin does that beautifully, I think. Um, uh, there are plenty of uh, plenty others, but uh, that is a uh, that is a thing that always I don't know it just draws me to it. You know the yeah. the, the color of that ivory next to a blasted titanium oh, it just looks so oh. nice. Yeah, but, but it's spectacular. I'm really nervous to work with it. Um, I've done one knife with it, but it was just a couple inlays. Um, I have pieces set aside to do full scales of, but I, I'm nervous to try it. Um, because apparently you, you you can't get it wet, you can't get it hot. I'm nervous to thin it out because I don't have a service grinder or anything like that. I'd have to do some redneck engineering to my mill to get it to, to mill correctly. Um, so it's just, <laughs> it's it's less nerve wracking to work with gold than it is for me to break into my mammoth stash. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And, and it's an expensive material and, the, and I, yeah. the dust is supposed to be really bad for you. I mean, the dust of all this stuff is bad for you, but. I don't know if it's, bad for you i'm sure it's not great for you but it stinks yeah yeah i've I heard mean, that too. it is pearl smells pretty bad but uh i've ground mammoth before and it 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 smells like petrified teeth it's bad <laughs> it's like smells someone like who has it is <laughs> oh, oh it is it lingers too like you grind it on a monday you still have that smell in here friday yeah it's it's bad like a mammoth was in there doing burpees breathing heavy Oh yeah, it's it's rough. It's rough. That's probably my least favorite like material as far as smells go. Like you have to wear a full face respirator, but even even that, it, your shop's gonna smell. Yeah, it's gonna stink. You need some you, breeze. You were talking about wanting to to work in titanium, and and it sent my mind in a couple of different places. First of all, uh, I would imagine working with titanium, as you mentioned, would be nerve wracking in that the expense, uh, you know, the learning curve would be very expensive. I think it, platinum, right? platinum what did i say titanium, titanium. yeah yes i'm sorry that's, a, that's, just wanted to clarify thank you thank you for doing so that is what you work with all the time every day uh but uh yeah platinum working with platinum making uh making platinum scales man uh you know you got to learn about each material i would imagine yeah. each material is different and and that would be an expensive uh learning curve um but how cool would <laughs> you know, that be you know, that would be a baller knife right there Yes, the initial cost would be crazy expensive. But even if you messed up, you know, you just sell back the messed up platinum, get a new piece. Thankfully, you know, like I said, it's infinitely right. recyclable. That's right. the really nice thing about working with precious metals. Um, the thing that I've learned about working with platinum is it's it's very gummy. Um, it's almost like drilling hard aluminum. It, it just wants to catch at at every point. And it is, it gets hot incredibly fast. All of the precious metals get hot really fast. They just conduct heat very well. That's why they're used in electronics. Um, it'd be, it would be a long build just, just from the drilling aspect. Um, drilling, cutting, it's a tough material, but it would be very cool. Unfortunately, I don't know that most people would be able to differentiate it mm -hmm. from just like a polished titanium. Um, at least I'm, I'm very colorblind and I have a hard time differentiating them, but it'd still be cool. Be a cool project. So you have these skills and abilities with these materials. Um, and it's not just, uh, sculpting, but it's engineering and making them work as a, as a tool. Um, are there other things uh, that you would, I mean, these are kind of the skills of a jeweler in a lot of ways. These these are skills of an engineer. These are skills of uh, a knife maker, obviously. Are there other products or things that you think about building and, and kind of bending these skills towards uh, outside of knives? I don't, I don't know at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty wrapped up in knives. I've invested a lot of time 
and energy into this. And I, I really love it and I don't want to stop. So trying to, you know, I don't want to dilute myself by trying to make new products. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm spread thin as it is. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I could go any thinner. Okay. So, so <laughs> that's, fun. well, that's what the print and that's what the Mac crusade are about. I, I would presume, you yeah. know, uh, making, making your stuff more widely available, not only to get them in the hands of, of a wider I mean, fan base, but to make are more still pretty limited. I mean, I'm okay. making 12 a month. Okay. Um, I mean, it's still more out there than, than I can get to in full customs. Right. Right. But... You're not making 12 full customs a month. I, right no yeah no, okay I, so you're able to get so this is a way of growing your company and growing your brand um is has this been happening organically does this kind of pop out of necessity or are you are you um do you have a certain aim about growing your company um like as far as why the mac crusades came up no 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 i just i just mean like it seems like you're expanding and i i that's exciting to me because yeah. you have these ways of putting out knives that aren't full custom that don't take as long how are you how are you aiming to to grow further uh i mean the production stuff i have um another design that i've made for production um i haven't released it yet I'm not going to until i have prototypes in hand uh but i have another one of those going it's just you know, I want to get my designs out there. I, I love designing knives. I, unfortunately, I can't make all of them custom. That would just be unrealistic. You know, I can't have 42 different knife models. But if I can take some of my designs and make them into production stuff that other people can enjoy while I focus on my custom stuff. I mean, I don't I don't see why those designs should sit there unused and unseen. Yeah. Yeah, I don't either, especially if you've got a fertile mind for knife design. Now, when you're designing these knives that, uh, that Riot builds or that you're having uh, different parts makers. And by the way, that, that's, uh, that's kind of like being a producer, right? Having, uh, having all those parts made in all these different places and bringing it all together, you're, you're orchestrating a production. Um, yeah. uh, but, but doing all this, uh, is the design process different? Do you design these things in CAD and send them out or do you build prototypes and send those out? Uh, it is prototyping. I, I don't know how to use CAD. I have the program on my computer and I've fiddled around with it and can't, I can't even make a straight line. I can't figure out any of it. Um, I'm a very pen and paper type person. Uh, and then I'll, it'll look terrible on pen and paper, but then, you know, I can visualize it in my head and put it into metal a lot better than I can draw it. So I'll, uh, like the, both prototypes for the print I made in metal, I, I made a really rough sketch um, and immediately put it into metal, made the prototypes with well, the first prototype. And it turned out so much better than the sketch did. Um, just something about being able to kind of make changes on the fly. I know my geometry, I know my lines. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'd much prefer to send, send stuff out, like physical copies. It's pretty uh, amazing to me as a pen and paper guy myself and someone very comfortable drawing <laughs> Um, that someone else finds it easier to express themselves in steel and titanium. You know, like I could just draw this down, but why don't, why don't I just whip one up over here in the shop? To yeah. me, that's amazing, man. <laughs> I'd rather yeah. spend three days in the shop getting it right than sending you a napkin sketch that's not yeah. working. <laughs> yeah, and and no doubt uh, the people on the receiving end are awfully psyched to get a, a working model that they can just yeah. uh, back engineer. Um, yeah, that made, that made it a lot easier for the print. Um, so 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 you send them a prototype this is yep. what i want the thing to be and then they send you a prototype back i would imagine yeah yep so that's, what's that exactly like it. what what's that like it's like i just sent you the prototype why are you sending me one back i mean obviously it's to see how they make it but what's that like honestly it's a bit weird when when i send a knife out and i'm expecting to get the same knife back essentially and then, you know, you see these small changes they've had to make because their manufacturing process is different than mine. I mean, obviously, I'm a guy with just a few machines in a garage um, and they have all sorts of capabilities. So it, it's just it's it's small stuff that's kind of strange to see. Um, for instance, one of the one of the things to me that that really stood out when I when I got this prototype is the thumb studs. Uh, I know it, it sounds insignificant, but I'd never seen this before, and I wasn't expecting it. 
but that's the hole for the thumb stud on the prototype. Uh, to put that in perspective, this is the hole for one of my customs. And this is the hole that comes in all of my customs with thumb studs on them. Much smaller. Yeah. So that, what's the, what's that was the like significance of that. They they just kind of lipped. They have like a shoulder on their thumb studs. And just seeing that and having that hole in the blade was kind of strange to see. It's just, it's weird seeing your, your work as not your work. Like so, your your work through the through the mind of somebody else slightly, yeah, yeah. Now to me, you know, not being you, uh, that seems like so incredibly minor. I might not even have noticed it, but of course, if it were <laughs> mine, I would have taken apart completely. Yeah. Uh, so you're just talking about the diameter of the hole and the fact that they've shouldered the yeah. uh, the. Okay, so so in in your opinion, is that a an inferior? Um, solution or is that just a different thing done for manufacturing not inferior um it, it's just the way they do it um mm -hmm. my goal with the with the print model was to be able to have people kind of change out the thumb studs to whatever they're most comfortable with they can change out the pivots to whatever they want and unfortunately this hole doesn't really allow that it is uh just about a 3 16 hole and uh so i had it changed for the final design so it's just like a number 44 hole through just like this this one here so Basically, any tie connector thumb stud should fit on it. Um, yeah, so it's not not in fear, just not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you, before. and and also not in keeping with the spirit of the design, which is to have it yeah. modular. I, I yeah. see. All right, all right. That makes sense. Uh, that's interesting to get it back because I'm thinking, you know, uh, of more structural changes or more um, more blatantly obvious changes. But that would be, you know. They got it. They got it pretty, pretty bang on. Um, the only real major change I made was the hollow grind uh, from the flat grind that they provided, and uh, I removed the floating backspacer and opted for a solid one, just for for ease of taking it apart. The way that this is manufactured from them, it, it's even difficult for me to take apart. So we wanted to make that a bit easier. Okay. Yeah. Well, so this this you've got like I'm just sitting here thinking about your set up your operation mm -hmm. and you have from my perspective you've carved out a really cool niche for yourself because you make these very um very fancy for lack of a better term high-end beautifully handmade and engineered knives that you have a a, a collector base for uh your books are closed kind of always right because yeah uh, I, on your I, website it seems too much like, going on yeah uh but You've remained independent. You're one person doing this, mm -hmm. but you've got your, uh, you've got multiple projects going on where you have different tiers of uh, where people can get your work. And I, I really hope that the the print keeps going. I mean, I, uh, I hope that's something that is self perpetuating because I like that idea of, uh, I mean, you know, you you don't have a whole group of employees you have to deal with. You you know, you're you're kind of low profile, but but. Yeah you've got tendrils out there and I, I, that seems like a really good business model because your exposure is low, uh, in terms of, um, you know, negatives, but your exposure is high in terms of how much you're out there. Yeah. It's a, it's a balancing act. Just trying to knock out all the projects and fun fact about the, the name print. Uh, I'm really into photography. Um, mm. and the reason I called this knife the print was because, uh, in photography, you take the photo, which would be my custom version of this knife, and then they produced prints of it. So that's why I called it the print. That is cool. That's great. <clears throat> that's that's what they used to do in the old days, right after the printing press was invented. You know, mm -hmm. you can't travel to Paris to see the Mona Lisa. You can buy a print of it. You know. Yep. Um, I love that. That's a great. I that's a that's a cool name. I, I like the meaning behind it. Thank you. Um, but that business model I was talking about that you that you employed, do you think that that's the new the new way of doing things? Uh, do you think that's going to be kind of more where companies are headed? It definitely looks like a lot of makers right now are trying to diversify. Um, I mean, aside from just customs, you know, I see the things that uh, Jim is doing over at HMC with the Mac stuff. Um, right now, it's me and Brian Efros, and I believe he has a few other makers on the way. Um, I think that's going to be 
becoming more popular. And then the print, I mean, Brian Brown has absolutely killed it with mm-hmm. his, his production stuff. He's doing awesome designs. He's coming out with really cool variations of it. Um, I, I want to say that American Knives, Kurt American, is doing a similar thing. Uh, there's there's a lot of makers right now who are just putting out really great production knives to kind of accompany their customs because unfortunately, in, in most of these cases, there's only one of us. I There's only so many hours in a day that I can be out here working. And, uh, and that goes for a lot of makers, I'd assume. So yeah, I, I think, you know, kind of having a production lineup, something that can still get your name out there, people can enjoy while kind of taking some of the pressure off of us to be working ourselves to the bone. Yeah, and from a collector's perspective... We, we still do. But... Yeah, well, yeah, right, right. You're, you're, yeah. This, uh, this is my happy place. I mean, if, if I'm in any mood that's not happy, I'm out here making knives because it's just, it is what I want to do and it's what I love. And I think you have to have that passion. Sorry to interrupt. Go. No, 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 please. It's about you. what I was going to say is from a collector's perspective, that's good news that a lot of people are moving that way because I would love to have a Brian Efros designed knife. That's really well made. I'm not necessarily trying to, to spend Brian Efros money. I'm not necessarily trying to spend CMF money. You know, no offense. Uh, okay. When I, when I can, I will. But my point is until then, I would love to have, uh, a collection that is that is aiming towards custom and on my way to get there mm-hmm. i've you know to have these mid techs or 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 uh, oemed knives by you and 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 uh, hmc uh, made knives from brian e Frost and that stuff like that like that is i'm getting all excited here that is a uh, that is the way to go that's a great yeah. uh thing to look forward to i guess i should say i mean brian's killing it with the mac dooms too uh, they are spectacular. Um, his his finish work is incredible. If, if if you're watching this and you want one, go get one. Okay. Uh, well, I'm watching. <laughs> you should go Brian, get one too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, there was a period of time right after Brian uh, was on the show where where um, you know I was trying to get a knife from him and and uh, he he was really cool. He's like, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll I'll you know I'll fit you in. And and after a while, I realized this. This is a this is a big commitment, and uh, you know I can't do this right now, and, and I definitely don't want him to fit me in, yeah. and, and then me be like I can't do this, <laughs> you know. So that guy that guy works so hard as well, and he's got a heart of gold. One of my favorite people. I'm very glad to call him a friend. That's cool. This is so. How would you define your generation of knife maker? Um, and and not to not to just put you on the spot, <laughs> but uh, you know, like. I'm old enough. I've I've been collecting knives my whole life. I've seen different kind of movements, and yeah. um, and I'm curious if you have any perspective from within your. I don't know, man. I I feel like right now designs are, you know, there's there's a market for everything. Uh, people are gonna like what people are gonna like, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I like the organic curvy stuff. Um, some people like more aggressive knives. Some people like kind of more straight line knives and. Then you have, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it. It was shown at Blade Show, the Cybertruck knife. Um, and that was really cool too. And people love that. So I, I think right now it's just kind of anything goes. You want to make it, there's probably someone out there who's going to love it. The cyber Sorry, that, if that knife. was a bad question. I don't, no, I don't no, know no, how no. to answer that. No, that's <laughs> a real anyway. I mean, that's kind of define your generation. It's like, uh, yeah. okay, <laughs> no, but uh, the cyber <laughs> truck knife is funny. I know which, I know which knife you're talking about. It looks just like the, the cyber yeah. truck. <laughs> I got to handle one. It was, it was really, really cool. Who made that? Who is that? I have no idea. Interesting. Uh, yeah, but I, I agree. I think there is, um, you know, well, if, if you're someone like me who has very varied tastes, uh, that's two different types of very two different spelling. But if you're mm-hmm. if you're um, you're excited or I'm excited about these times because everyone there is someone making there are many people making every of those styles that you mentioned. I love um, weapony knives and I can find those, you know, I love old school. I love ethnographic knives and you can find uh, people making 
you know, there's this guy, the Spanish knife maker, um, Miguel Barbudo, who makes mm -hmm. navajas and a lot of other things too. But his navajas are like that's a that's a uh, that's a grail for me, as well as a uh, Charles Marlowe, as well as an Ian Pekarsky. You know, like all. So right now it's a very exciting time because you can have anything if you can if you yeah. can afford it and find it, you can have anything. They're really really nice knives out right now. Really spectacular work being done. So where does a company like, and I, I'm going to call them out because, uh, um, they, what, are, what, what about a company like CRKT? Are they making themselves irrelevant in that they, they've been coming out with knives from designers. They've been innovative for so long and been doing so much cool stuff for so long, but they refuse to come along with the materials. I, I don't know a company like that. Is it going to be big? I don't box? have enough insight into that to, to have any reasonable opinion. I, I just don't know. I haven't interacted with them. I don't follow them. And unfortunately, it's just not something I feel I can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Look for the new uh, CMF CRKT collaboration, ladies and gentlemen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. I mean, um, that would be cool. And that's the kind of thing they do. Uh, they collaborate with interesting designers, um, and and I guess they they leave it within reach for everyone. So maybe I should just. I think my, Brian Edwards actually just them. did two two designs with them. I want to say it's CRKT. He did, did he? the jive, and he did a uh, um, a fixed blade design that looks really spectacular. Me and my uh, they, they look great. I got to handle them. I but like I said, I I just don't know enough about CRKT or kind of that side of the production market to really be able to to talk about it in any yeah. good way well you know i realized as i was actually asking the question there there is a whole gigantic uh knife market much bigger than the one that i think about most of the time which is collectors and fine you know people who really spend a lot of time thinking about knives there's a yeah. huge market way outside of that way bigger than that that buys yeah. that buys these knives because they use them and they need them and and crkt allows them a little bit of style and and flair and innovation I need to remember that. That's a little snobby. That was a snobby question, but I didn't mean it to be so. It's it's a fair question. I just don't know the answer, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so what uh, what knife that you have not made do you want to make sometime? Like, what what is your white whale in terms of making? Something complex, uh, something really difficult. Let me see if I have it above me here. I have a set of pearl that... I have been saving for a very special build. And I'd like to make a full scale oh. pearl knife with a mere polished blade um, and make it just really special somehow. But this is like once in a lifetime pearl, uh, in my opinion. It's like a quarter inch thick. It's like presentation grade. It's just beautiful. And the knife I've been saving these. I'm going to save them for another few years before I even think about it. But I, uh, I want to make a full pearl knife. Everything fully hidden hardware. There's no pivots showing, no screws showing, no pocket clip, mere polished blade. Mm -hmm. Just, just clean pearl and polished steel. And that uh, that right there is, that's the material in my shop that I look at and say, Nah, not today, not today, <laughs> not good enough yet. Nope, not there. So that pearl, is that actual uh, pearl from oysters that has been broken down and re... Is that, what is that? Exactly? Uh, I actually, I have pearl shell here. Uh, I can show you what it looks like. Somewhere. Sorry, I didn't know That's I was going to need this. <laughs> but a, a pearl shell is... Uh... So this is a pearl shell. Oh my God. This is how... This is how they get them. This is a really, really small one. I bought this just to be able, for kind of situations like this, just so I can show them. Uh, so they'll get these, and they'll weigh, I think they said five to 10 pounds just for one shell. And that will produce like a set like this, like just like a three and a half inch by one and a quarter inch set, like just, just one of these. Wow. And that's why, that's why you don't see big ones like this anymore because we've, we've basically harvested all of them that are the same that are the size needed to get pieces like this. Um, if you want to see a really good example of how it's done, uh, Bastion knives uh, from Australia, I believe has some videos up of him 
getting a whole shell and actually making his own pearl slabs out of it with a with a wet grinder. If you've ever seen a throwing wheel uh, with like for ceramics mm-hmm. type deal, that's kind of how it goes. It, it, it's just sandpaper on there. He's wet sanding it and he's making slabs out of the whole shell. It's very cool to see. So how did you come about this piece of pearl? Uh, it was actually given to me. Given to me by a local collector. All right. All right. Well, yeah. we got to keep an eye on your feed and see when you're going to use that. Because that that knife sounds beautiful. <laughs> uh, the the uh, the idea of just high polished, a high polished blade from you and then some gorgeous handle just with that, with everything hidden. I mean, that sounds... That does sound like a grail knife for sure. It, it sounds like one I want to build. <laughs> it sounds like one I'm yeah. nervous to build. I, that makes me, it makes me anxious even thinking about it. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. Because uh, yeah. uh, when I knew a lot of actors, they always said, if it feels scary, do it. And I always thought that yeah. was a very actory yeah. thing to say, but that's kind of the kind of thing you need to say to get yourself to do some. I'd like it to be thing. a little less. <laughs> Like it can still be <laughs> yeah. scary, but not as scary as it is now, you know? Right, right. All right. So, uh, Ian, what can we expect from you uh, coming forward? And what's the best way for people to keep up with your work and find out what's uh, what's coming down the pike? Um, I got CCKS coming up in October. Uh, I'll have a bunch of Mac Crusades with me. Um, I'm focusing right now on, on book orders. And then I'll be going out to Brian Epros's shop to work with him for a week for the CCKS show. Um, we got the prints coming out. Uh, we did the pre-order for them. Hopefully we'll, uh, we should have these in like February. We'll have a few more to sell. Um, the best way to find me and follow me is probably my Facebook group. Uh, I'm most active in there. If you want to see like more behind the scenes stuff, uh, work in progress, just, you know, some of my personal life and all sorts of random crap. Uh, if you just want to see the finished products or, you know, some more refined work in product, work in, pro- work in process photos, my Instagram is probably the way to go. Um, I, I have been neglecting it a little bit uh, as they've changed it to the point where, you know, nothing gets seen anymore and it's a pain in the butt to use. Uh, but I've been trying to post uh, better videos and pictures on there, trying to be more active. Uh, so if you want to see finished product stuff, you can see that. This, this one was, uh, was just up there. Uh, in fact, I think you showed it for a moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You you have lots of great videos in your Instagram feed. Uh, I'm really digging the videos because uh, they give you a good sense of, you know, you walk someone around the knife, you give them a good sense of what it's like, especially if you've held a knife in your hand, yeah. you can look at yours and know that's going to feel awesome. All right, Ian, I know you got a, you got a wedding to get off to. Yeah. I gotta, uh, I gotta go be in a wedding now. <laughs> he's, he's about to get in a tux, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time to join us here and, and uh, catch us up with what's been going on with CMF metalworks. Been a pleasure, sir. Ah, as always. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, all right. Take care. You Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. Uh, very, very exciting. Well, always good to see Ian, of course. Uh, but this Mac Crusade is exciting because it's something we talk about a lot here. Um, and uh, this idea of more production style knives being made in the United States. I'm going to have to do uh, more looking into it. Uh, really would, wouldn't mind having myself a Mac Crusade in the future. So we'll see all about that. Anyway, uh, check us out next week for another great interview and uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental where we go over new knives in my collection and other stuff. And then Thursday night knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time live here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, Uh, For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear 
hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.